Okay, so I guess we'll start from managing software bits and pieces in the previous talk. Now we are switching gears a bit to managing hardware bits and pieces and talk about the hot topic of RISC-V. <laughs> uh, bit about me at the beginning. I'm Heiko Stübner. I work for Vril on RISC-V stuff. And in my spare time, I'm also maintaining the workshop SOC support in the mainline kernel. And uh, I have a dark past. I was a web developer for 12 years before this. <laughs> so what is RISC-V? Well, I guess most people will have heard of it. RISC-V is a so-called modular instruction set architecture. And it's a reduced instruction set. That's, that's the RISC versus CISC uh, differentiation. It was started in 2010 in the University of California, Berkeley, and the five in RISC V means that it's the fifth try of them. <laughs> like there are RISC 1, 2, 4 uh, before this. The whole thing is BSD licensed, so it's uh, open for anybody to use and adapt. And it's targeting like every hardware size you can imagine, from microcontrollers to laptops and to even servers. And you can see uh, there the an expressive mod, uh, ESP32 module using a RISC-V core. There is an announced uh, RISC-V laptop, which is more like a toy because the uh, SOC used in it is very uh, low powered. And I guess there are even hardware, uh, server grade CPU cores announced. So what is an ISA? ISA means an instruction set architecture, not the ISA bus for the older people among us. And it essentially, an ISA describes essentially the possible instructions a CPU can execute. For example, the first one is the load a value into a register and or add one register to another and write the result in the register but the ISA does not specify how this is implemented. This is the so-called then microarchitecture which, which uh, companies then need to invent themselves. So for uh, also to show where the ISA lives in, essentially when you take your uh, SB, uh, the, a, a common SBC like this one, it's a, a, you have, the, of course, the SOC, which is a little bit, bit larger here. In this case, that's the all-winner D1, which is right now, I guess, the nearly most common uh, cheap SOC you can uh, use on a RISC-V board. And in the SOC, an SOC normally has this nice diagram of their components for display, video, peripherals, and then the, the most important part of is always the CPU core. And the CPU core, and the, and in this case the T hat C906, uh, will use uh, the actual CPU core, which is the, uh, which is the, uh, essentially implements the ISR you are using. Among some other things like caches and interrupt controllers. Uh, in comparison to things like ARM, RISC-V is very modular. You always uh, specify a, a very minimal basis, that's the RV32i or RV64i. It's really only an integer set of uh, instructions and some control functions, but can't do really much. So you end up with the, uh, for example, with the uh, RV64 IMAFD plus I, uh, ZICSR plus ISN, IFENS I thing, which uh, is described, for example, in device trees as the ISA string and describes the ISA. And which is also then because uh, in the integer set is way too uh, less featureful, they already specified this combination as G for general purpose. And the individual uh, letters then describe uh, extensions for specific functions. For example, uh, M defines instructions for doing simple multiplications, which 
the integer set does not define at all. And you have atomic instructions and floating point and the access to control and status registers and access synchronization. And that's like the basic thing you want to actually have a somehow meaningful uh, CPU core. Uh, yeah, okay. The RISC-V extensions are also essentially a never-ending story because while we had the basic extensions uh, you, we had on the previous slide, the, the, the amount of extensions is growing all the time. There are tiny ones like, for example, ZBB, ZBZ, that's instructions for doing bit manipulation in the CPU itself. But there are also like big ones like the vector instructions or even the H for the hypervisor, so uh, virtualization uh, extension. And the list is growing all the time with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, extensions in different states of discussion and ratification. And of course, uh, the most interesting part on this is that when you when your company is designing an risk V CPU core, they can essentially pick the extensions they like. They can they can take vector. They can leave out ZBB. They can take uh, whatever and combine them to their liking in their, uh, in, their, in their core, which is essentially different to other architectures where the main company then just defines a set of features. Like an ARM Cortex A53 will always have a specific set of features. Yeah. And <coughs> extensions also can do a number of things. They can like, for example, ZBB, the bit manipulation extension, just adds some new instructions. But they can also add new control registers or add also add bits to existing registers. So in some registers have reserved bits and new extensions then can uh, just define them for, for their own use, which always will... Uh, need the discussion to actually make sure that nothing overlaps and nothing conflicts. This brings for, so for the software system uh, a, a number of interesting uh, challenges. Because uh, when you're compiling a program, you're always compiling it for a, a specific, specific set of instructions. So which extensions are you allowing at compile time? which then will also need to be present on the running runtime system. Because when, when, you, when you execute a, when execute an instruction that isn't supported, uh, you will get a an, an program abort. And yeah. <coughs> so, and this of course as described leads to a, 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 a giant number of possible combinations and for general distributions, the main issue is that it will most likely lead to a least common denominator effect. Because when you have a distribution like SUSE, Debian or whatever, they want to run on the most number of boards and will never allow doing ports for this combination and that other combination of extensions. But one, but for example, Debian will have one risk 64-bit uh, port, not 15. But uh, when, when, when you en end up in this least common denominator effect, this will always cause, cause suboptimal performance because, of course, the compiler could optimize more. To showcase this, I have a small example. When you uh, essentially, I've, I've picked a, a really easy uh, extension, multiplication, the M extension we had on the, uh, on, on the, previously on this slide. Like when you have this code, a function that returns a uh, times b, when you have the uh, multiplication extension av available, it's just the mul w uh, instruction that executes this and returns the value in a, a zero. 
when you don't have the multiplication instruct, uh, the multiplication extension, you end up with this big hunk of code, which essentially does the same, but only using integer instructions. So when when you essentially when your uh, software ecosystem like where does not require the M, the M uh, extension, you would end up with this really with this, uh, with this code with really or uh, really bad performance. There are also more challenges for the developers in this case. The, because uh, Risk Five is not driven by one company, but by a lot of committees and work groups, you end up with a lot of discussion, and everything takes a lot of time. Like you have the discussion period, then the extension will at some point get frozen, then ratified, and the extension really only is stable after this ratification. And then the support for example new instructions needs to go into the compiler which then needs a release and also uh, new hardware can only be developed after the extension is ratified uh, also as well so only after ratification the uh, hardware companies can develop a cpu core which then can get put into an soc which then can bu get put onto a board <laughs> so during development of all of this People spend so much time in QEMU, <laughs> and you, uh, the, uh, also the, the interesting part on QEMU is that you also need to enable which extensions you actually want to run on your virtual system. So this uh, dash CPU line gets very long over time. So and, and of course, there's all the challenges for distributions. As I said. There will most likely only one architecture port for in each distribution. Nobody wants to handle 15 with five ports. There's also only one kernel image, which has the same issue. Which extensions do you enable? And when 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 ARM uh, when when Debian did the uh, the transition from from the one ARM port to, uh, to ARML and ARM uh, hard float, there was also a, a long uh, discussion over this baseline to use which uh, which boards to still allow and which boards to uh, then which old old boards to not allow anymore. And for example, in Debian, it's still a port and not a release architecture. And also in Debian, you, you see I'm coming a lot of from Debian from the Debian side. In uh, Debian, for example, the current baseline is very generic, which is the RV64GC, which is the generic we had before, plus uh, compressed instructions, which is thump in ARM uh, speak. So there is really no no optimization for newer uh, extensions that could make this uh, more performant. And as as I said on the uh, on the uh, previous slide, we have also the issue of there is will only be one kernel for it for a distribution. In the past, uh, in in the embedded world, we often had the issue that you had one kernel per SOC or SOC family, which lead to uh, le led to a lot of um, issues. When you had, for example, in the in the ARM32 land, you had for all these all these architect, uh, sub architectures had their own kernel images, which led to the maintenance nightmare that uh, essentially Torvalds also uh, commented on back in 2011. So today we always have the one kernel image per architecture that then has to sort itself out at runtime. For example, by using device tree or ACPI or whatever, and we have this, these central systems for uh, the embedded, uh, nah, embedded parts of an SOC. But how can the kernel adapt itself to the RISC-V uh, 
specialities because it's the most central component. It starts once and runs until the system is powered down or restarted. And especially in the Linux kernel, every improvement you can use can improve performance a lot. But we always have the same problem, which extensions can we assume are there? And in the kernel itself, there is the even more special case that some extensions are actually needed to make a system work. Uh, I have an example later on. But on other systems, enabling this extension will cause, of course, illegal instructions and uh, cause them uh, uh, a hang. And the example is, in this case, cache management. All older systems were considered cache coherent, like some magic in the, uh, in the, in the SOC is handling all the cache, hand, cache access and the invalidation and everything. But nowadays we also have the Zigbom extension, which defines explicit instructions for flushing, invalidating, and cleaning uh, a number of caches. So on the one hand, you need the extension available on systems that implement Zigbom because they won't be cache coherent by default. On the other hand, you can't use it on systems that don't implement it because you will end up in an, with an illegal instruction. <clears throat> and of course, uh, there are also challenges for CPU manufacturers because the specification is the theory and more, uh, is essentially uh, make, makes QMO happy and is just written on in a nice document you can read and then implement. But if, if the past told at least me anything, the implement, implementation will most, most of the time not really be 100% accurate. Some, often some issue remains. And there are also special cases, like Frank, the mentioned all winner D1, which uh, essentially sits between the, uh, the actual official uh, extension. For example, it implements memory types, for, like standard I.O. memory and non-cached memory, but is different than the official SVBBMT extension, which defines this, simply because the SOC uh, the CPU core was designed before the extension was ratified. Similarly, uh, it implements cache management, but different than Zigbom with different instructions. And it, impl it implements uh, the vector extension, but in the not ratified version 0.71 0 instead of the official 0, uh, 1.0. And yeah. So how would you solve these challenges in the kernel or in the systems itself? Of course, at first we need to detect what is actually there. The most central uh, mechanism to detect uh, the extensions in the running system is the so-called ISO string, which is living in the device tree. And this can get quite long because you have the, uh, the base string with the single letter extensions and then with underscores there are so-called multi-letter extensions which then implement sometimes very uh, central, sometimes very obscure things. For example, uh, ZB is uh, everything bit manipulation, with a K it's crypto extensions, and there are more crypto extensions, <laughs> There are vector crypto extensions. And the, uh, Z, uh, the ISO string also gets exported to proc CPU info. And some parts also get detected via firmware, for example, via uh, device tree elements. And there is the uh, central, register, central registers of the CPU, like the vendor ID, the architecture ID, and implementation ID, which should identify the CPU itself, except when they hopefully except when they hopefully are, no, are not zero. Yeah, okay. One, th uh, the thing about the compiler I touched on is that to use an instruction, you would always need the uh, newest compiler that, um, that uh, supports this instruction. 
So when you, but when you wait for the next GCC release to actually use an instruction, you're waiting a lot of time, and also you're limiting your the the compiler you can use to com compile your project. For example, the, the Linux kernel most of the time only requires a, an ancient baseline GCC or LLVM. You can you are allowed to use newer ones, but and generally, you don't want to require like the everybody to use the newest GCC. And similar distributions and an older older uh, and current SUSE release won't have a compiler with support for some new uh, extension. And projects always will be reluctant to uh, to, to step up the requirement for the compiler. The alternative is to use pre-built introductions, which the kernel uses quite a lot of, where you essentially, when you are when you are having assembler already, you are just uh, you're not you're, you're not describing the instruction itself, but like using it pre-encoded on what the compiler would uh, would create from the assembler instruction. And yeah. And uh, the link down below is uh, a, a nice uh, JavaScript application that essentially can move the, from, from the instruction to the encoded variant and back, which helps in uh, doing this. <laughs> so, okay, so how do, we guess, how do we get the best performance? Uh, the optimal way would be doing it the essentially Yocto way to just rebuild everything or every time. Like have the newest, newest compiler and know what system you're running on and then build everything from scratch. Then you get, would get the ultimately best performance from everything. But as, as I said before, then, there, then we wouldn't have generic distributions. And who wants to build Chromium locally? And so the solution for is to essentially implement multiple variants and select at runtime. Of course, the simplest way would be a simple conditional, which is uh, shown on the right, which is part of OpenSSL, where they have this big if blocks uh, where they select on what extension is available to, in this case, uh, select the most performant routines for doing uh, GCM GHS calculations. So if, if it has ZVK and the vector length is bigger than 128, and if it also has ZVKB and or ZBB, and <laughs> it get it gets quite uh, a lot, especially as this list as this list won't be finished because in the future we'll have probably more extensions doing different uh, allowing different uh, solutions, and of course also using uh, uh, using function pointers also creates overhead in itself. I guess in the open SSL case, it, it's, it doesn't matter so much for the cost because you have uh, the cryptographic routine itself will take more time. But when you, have, when you are in the kernel in some very central place, even resolving the function pointer will incur too, incur too much overhead. glibc, uh, on the other hand, brings an... Uh, its own mechanism to do this a bit more performantly. It's essentially also an indirect function call, the so-called ifunc, but it, it hides the logic uh, from, from the developer and from the uh, performance. <clears throat> and essentially the resolution for, the, uh, for which function to use is done at the startup of the program. For example, in this case, we are selecting between a number of str string compare functions with either generic with zbb and another zbb variant 
and this resolution is done once and the program then always will call the correct str cmp function during its runtime. So uh, as a, and essentially the pro in, in the program itself you're always calling str cmp and you you are, you, ha you don't uh, get in, into contact with the uh, with the whole ifunc functionality. And the Linux kernel then uh, is sort of a special case because while, for example, the glibc ifunc can start the program and resolve the, possi the capabilities and then uh, resolve the ifunc uh, function calls as needed, the kernel uh, is already running when it knows what's, uh, what's available. So this essentially limits the optimizations you can do at startup. Uh, conditionals and function pointers of course work, but kernel functions like string compare and friends run so many times that performance really matters. So the way to go for the kernel is patching it at runtime. That's different than the live patching, <laughs> but it's still changing the kernel code at runtime. And essentially we have three methods to do this. The one thing are so-called static calls. Uh, a static call is, an, is essentially a function pointer, but it uh, behaves as if the function is called directly. And actually that the, 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 the mechanism is an optimization that was invented after all the spectrum mitigations are, uh, were done. So it works like a function pointer but actually does direct function calls but it does need architecture specific implementation. I've seen discussions on doing this for ARM64 and RISC-V uh, doesn't have it right now. One other uh, po pos uh, positive thing is that you're doing your code in uh, Z, not in assembler. The second option is the so-called static key static branch mechanism where you select essentially always between two implementations. You have an likely one and an unlikely one. And the unlikely one gets the speed penalty. Also, uh, the that, that's supported in RISC-V and the code is also written in C, which makes this uh, easy to handle. And on the right side you'll see an example of this. And the option three, which I guess is the most versatile, are the so-called alternatives, where you are replacing one block uh, of assembly code with a different block of, of assembly code. Of course, the disadvantage already is that everything needs to be in assembly. And also that the blocks need to have the same size, so you are adding knob instructions a lot. And of course, there is also no compiler optimization because you need to hand weave your own assembly. But the big advantage is that there is really no performance penalty at runtime because you are removing one piece of code and moving in a different piece of code. And also it allows multiple variants. You can, you have the one block of code and you can either put in this one or this one or this one. And you have essentially unlimited variants you can use. Ah, okay, this is maybe a bit convoluted. It's like an, that's the, uh, SV, uh, the memory type patch uh, for the, for both the SVBBMT Code uh, implement, uh, extension and also for the uh, T head D1, which essentially does different things, like the, there are different bits. <laughs> and I'm nearly out of time. <coughs> and yeah, okay. Uh, also, alternatives are used to handle, for example, also uh, CPU avatar. Da -da 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 -da. Also, uh, interesting also is that, that the whole thing needs to be done for modules as well. And yeah, but the module handler itself already has the finalized step where 
this patching can also done, be done for at the time the module gets inserted. And yeah. Okay. So and in conclusion we have many code and future extensions and rebuilding would lead to best performance but we'll always need implementation variants I guess. So yeah. And I guess I'm nearly out of time and we could do a question if there are some. Ah, there's one. Uh, can we hope that uh, platforms like the All Winner D1 are, can, are just quickly forgotten about? Like, uh, for example, with ARMv6 on the ARP Raspberry Pi 1, <laughs> it's, it's mostly ignored. And uh, because the Raspberry Pi 3 and 4 have like 100, million, 100x times more shipments, so <laughs> nobody has the old. Well, I, Pi 1 not in particular, but D, I hope the D1 doesn't show up. I guess the uh, for, uh, for the the D1 is basically supported in mainline nowadays, and it's it do, it doesn't cause overhead right now because the, the uh, for everything we are doing for the D1 it's always just a second variant next to the standard extension. Like uh, for, when we need to patch the kernel for SVPBMT memory types already, and the D1 is just the second uh, block of code we are patching in if needed. May I make a historic reference here because Linux was first built on the Intel 8386, mm. which is today, I think, unsupported. <laughs> but I think that's, that's a, a, a more recent development. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess uh, once, once all the D1s are broken, then I guess somebody will remove it, but I don't think we are losing it so, min so, so, so early because also we don't have that much actual risk five hardware right now. Yeah. Well, well, a custom build shouldn't be a big problem, but I mean when you have a distro that tries to support the D1 and the D2, for example, and the D1, for example, would be compliant with the 1.0 spec, then I would hope that distros would say, ah, nobody uses the D1, so. As, uh, at least on the distribution side, the D1 causes no overhead at all. You can boot the Debian Risk Five port just fine on the D1 when you have a recent enough kernel. Did they, did they pick option three for that, or which option? Sorry? Did, which option uh, to patch the kernel did they pick? Option three, or yeah, it is, uh, it's all alternatives. Like uh, that, that's, that was my project. So, and the, the idea always was we are impl we are implementing the standard extensions. SVPBMT and Zigbom in this case, and thankfully the D1 uh, does really the same as the standard extensions, just in a slightly different way. So instead of patching in a Zigbom cache flush, we are patching in a all win uh, and T hat cache flush instruction. It's really the same, which is nice <coughs> in this case. Yeah, what I'm a bit uh, worried about is that as you put in the alternatives to actually support a chip that is not spec compliant will open the door to hardware, hardware vendors to build whatever they want because yeah you can just put in some alternatives and then uh, your chip gets compliant and that I suppose over time will blow the kernel code uh, to make it quite difficult to maintain let's say this way. Yeah I, I guess that's, that's really a discussion that's still ongoing and Different people have different uh, ideas about this. <laughs> and yeah, I guess we'll see how this develops. Also, there is the issue that companies can, uh, can re are really allowed to invent their own extensions. They, don't, uh, they can uh, create an invention X something, which means vendor, vendor something. And the, the discussion really is not finished on are we allowing this in the kernel? But I get, right now it's shifting more into, into, allowing, uh, into allowing parts of it if it doesn't break, per, like the, 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 the big, uh, the big uh, thing uh, always is that we, will, we should never break or, or cause per performance penalties for these they're not compliant chips. That's always the, the, the measure. That we are not not making uh, things for the standard uh, course uh, worse. Yeah, so, so I would have a, another trick question, tricky question. 
because uh, yeah, with, with all these uh, whole lot of uh, additional functionalities that the CPU can implement, I understand that might work better in an embedded embedded world, like an embedded Linux world, but for the server space, I suppose if they really want to get there, they would need like to standardize much more what is expected, what should be supported, and how it should uh, all work, you know, yeah, like how the boot process should work, etc. So do you know if there are any efforts from the RISC-V community to work on that? I think there are something called profiles, which is supposed to essentially uh, describe uh, a profile for, I think, servers or something, which then would encompass a set of, in, a set of uh, extensions. But I think that's still all in discussion. And of course, as mentioned before, when you standardize on one bigger chunk of extensions, you are always uh, pushing out everybody that doesn't implement this one specific extension you always you you, always, you already specified and you always you wanted to have. So I guess the discussion for this will be long and tedious. <laughs> Any more question? No? Ah, that's not one. Last one. Um, regarding the multiplication example that you were showing there, have you actually reviewed the um, compiler settings that OpenSUSE is using for its uh, RISC-564 <laughs> port and whether there is something that we should be optimizing there? <laughs> not really. Like The multiplication was my example because you can, I could show the, the issue in a very, a very short piece of code and the, the, the difference is like very visible. Like, uh, yeah, and, <laughs> yeah, okay, and I got the signal that, like, I'm, like for example, Debian is using the RV64GC baseline, so multiplication, of course, is in there, and you never want to build a system without multiplication. <laughs> it was like more like the, it, 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 it made a nice example to show the difference. Okay. Thank you.